Bueller. Yes, I do like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Awesome, we appear to be live. All righty. Hello, all the humans. Welcome to the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix Sunday Speaker event. Please hit the like button and subscribe to get more of our awesome content or better yet, become a member of HSGP and volunteer for something that fills you with joy. Today, we have Dr. William Woody with Police Interrogation, The Search for Truth at the Intersection of History, Law, and Psychology. William Douglas Woody, PhD, is a professor of psychological sciences at the University of Northern Colorado, where he teaches and conducts research on psychology and law, the history of psychology, the, and the teaching of psychology. He has co-authored and co-edited numerous books, peer-reviewed journals, and invited in invited chapters. His scholarship centers on the experimental and the historical study of the psychology of interrogation and confession. He is married and a father of two children, ages nine and 13, and he thrives in his family's organic garden and compost. Please give a big HSGP welcome to Dr. William Woody. Wow, thank, thank you very much, y'all, and thank you for having me. So thank you for adapting to this, this complex Zoom format. Now, as you just heard, we're going to talk about a lot of different ideas related to police interrogation today. I look forward to really good questions and really good discussion at the end. So we'll try to have a good time. So first, to be reassuring, I know there are a number of things we're going to talk about today. A couple of people have noted that didn't you, didn't you create a 400-page book manuscript that came out last year? And the answer to that is yes. And we're not going to attempt to do all of it in the next 59 minutes. So everybody take a big deep breath and remain calm. It'll all be okay. But what I'd like to do today is talk some about the history of civilian policing in the U.S., particularly interrogation, because that sheds light on the current practices of interrogation. And I'd like to talk about the current practices and the psychological factors that drive interrogation and confession that make it unique as a legal area. And I'd like to end with some talk about ongoing reforms and some recommendations of things that we can do if so we so choose to support those reforms. And again, I really look forward to um, really, really good questions on this. So and I'll, I'll try to watch the chat a little bit as I do this, but I'll be focusing on us. So if I've missed some things, we'll go back and get them a little bit later, but I'll provide a link with information about the book here at the end. Come out through New York University Press. It's very exciting for us. And again, we won't put all 400 pages here in the next little bit of time. So what we'll do is we'll start with some about history. And like I said, that will set the stage for current policing. And as we do this, of course, if we're going to talk about a history of policing in the United States and contemporary policing in the United States, just like if we were talking about K through 12 education, university education, healthcare, housing markets, rental markets, job access, and health outcomes, and a variety of other things. Of course, we're going to talk about racial biases and other biases that run through our culture. So I'll be ready for really good questions and we'll just charge right in. So if we look at the history of civilian policing in the US, generally we have two tracks. We're gonna talk about two tracks of influence that gave us our current system of policing. The first one, is European. The second one is very much homegrown and unique to the United States. To what was the colonial places that became the United States as well as to the US. So let's start with the European track. In the 16, 17, and 1800s, various European governments experimented with civilian policing as cities grew in density. There were lots of potential models. Our primary model came to us from England in the United Kingdom, primarily out of London, and formed city model for city policing starting on the East Coast in the US. But there were other models that we did not choose that did not shape the British model. So the French had a strong model with road patrols and policing in major cities, but the French model was very much anchored on protecting the wealth and power of those with wealth and power. The British worldview at this time and remember the complexities. Slavery was legal in the British Empire until 1808. They were still a strong proponents of human rights. So really hear that dichotomy. This is not a simple approach to human rights any more than it was in the United States. But there was a strong emphasis on individual human rights. And there was great concern that civilian policing may not be compatible with an emphasis on individual human rights. For those of you who are flashing back to your early American history education in high school, remember the Boston Massacre? 
This is a, again, protest between the citizens of Boston in the 1770s and the occupying British army that was then pushed onto the citizens of Boston, causing great tension. People in London were afraid that if they had a civilian police force, it would function like an occupying army that saw civilians as the enemy. And they were very familiar with what it, is, what it was like to live under the thumb of an occupying army who saw you as the enemy, who had freedom and authority to take food, to take other resources from you. And there were great concerns. So I'll be brief about this history. Some of you know about the early formation of Robert Peel as Home Secretary in England, who finally, after several failures, pushed through the Metropolitan Police Act in 1829 and launched the civilian police force. You might have wondered in your lifetime, why do U.S. police officers often wear blue? Pretend it's England in the 1829, and you want nobody to confuse civilian police with the military. What is the British Army wearing at this time? And back to Revolutionary War imagery in the U.S., they're wearing bright red. Why did Peel pick blue? Because it's not red. Why do U.S. police officers wear blue in 2020? Because in the 1829 in England, it was not red. There will be some more substantive stuff we do today, but hopefully that's a good start this way. So it's blue, not red. So we don't want anyone to think it's an occupying army. They were recruited officers from the neighborhoods where they lived and people engaged in policing in the neighborhoods where they lived. And this, these traditions exist in many jurisdictions in the U.S. still. There are many areas that require officers to live in the jurisdictions they police. And this is part of that history. They paid police rates similar to skilled workers so they would not feel above or below the people whom they policed. And they established a very strong public service emphasis and, generally speaking, did not carry lethal force as is the case for some police officers in England today. Again, to distinguish themselves from an occupying army. So this is one set of factors that then came into the US. So this is one piece that we're going to see. Again, blue uniforms and urban areas and public service characterize early policing in the US. But there is another uniquely United States trend for policing that is an early civil form of civilian policing that shapes the way that we see law enforcement and law enforcement duties today. These emerged in colonial areas that became the United States, and they were prominent and throughout much of the United States up to the Civil War. And these, of course, were slave patrols, as they were called. These obviously had a very obvious and intense racial bias. They were organizations of white citizens, policing citizens who were not white. And they were, of course, looking to apprehend people who had escaped enslavement, but also they were a threat to people who did not escape enslavement. People who had been born free or had been otherwise free were still at risk from slave patrols. And this was explicitly racial local policing. After the Civil War, when the US government no longer supported legal slavery, racial, there were strong racial biases in local policing continued is required to uphold local law. The system that is called Jim Crow cannot exist without support from police. Remember, it's not just police, it's also a variety of other groups that I'll note here in a moment. But policing through much of the late 1800s and through much of the 20th century was explicitly racially biased by law. If you were a police officer in Birmingham, Alabama under Bull Connor and you said, no, I don't think we should engage in racially biased policing, did you still work for Bull Connor? Obviously, and that's an egregious example. We see this in a variety of places. <clears throat> It is very hard for people today to imagine Jim Crow. Again, all of the written laws, all the unwritten laws. If you are not white and you pass somebody who's driving very slowly, you've just, you pass a white driver who's driving very slowly, you've just broken the law in a number of jurisdictions and police are responsible for enforcing this. But it's not just Jim Crow and it's not just the former Confederate South. It's racial covenants across the country. There's a growing field in sociology and other areas of called, that Jim Lowen calls sundown studies, looking at the study of sundown towns and whites only jurisdictions across the US. Uh, Jim Lowen has spent his entire career, over 50 years, in contemporary consequences of historical discrimination. He went to his home state of Illinois. He thought he might be able to document five or 10 sundown towns, towns that were whites only after sundown. He documented over 300. These were widespread across the US. Often they came with signs and the signs were horrific. They often started with a word that started with N and then it's posted up on the sign, put there by the city council 
and protected by the police officers like the other public signs that, that establish that jurisdiction. And it said, don't let the sun go down on you in name of jurisdiction. And police officers were required to enforce that. These existed across the country. Remember, if you, if you were not white, you could work at the Ford Dearborn plant in the 50s, but you could not live in Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan was whites only. And this existed across the country. So this is a large talk unto itself, but we need to realize if you're going to make an area all white, this is very difficult to do. One of the common misconceptions we have today is that areas that are mostly white or mostly populated by people of other races just happened accidentally. It is very, very hard to segregate people. And if, it, if it's happened, it is according to Lowen and others, it's happened intentionally. And it's essentially all hands on deck. It takes realtors, it takes banks, it takes federal housing authority and redlining, it takes school boards, it takes school districts, housing authorities, HOAs, neighborhood groups, and police officers, and mayors and city councils and others. If you were a police officer who refused to engage in racially biased policing in the mid 20th century, you may not have gotten to keep your job. And even when those policies largely faded in by explicitly, the signs came down in many places in the 60s and 70s. There were some signs up into the 90s in a number of places, including within an hour of where I grew up, which was in Southern Ohio. But police officers had primary responsibility for this. And the, the again, the enforcement didn't stop in many jurisdictions just because the laws changed. There's a couple in my extended family where they're a heterosexual couple. He's black and she's white. And she lived in a place that had been whites only until just until they started to get together. And then it opened up for other people as they were still dating. And he has a positive spin for it. His answer is, I felt so safe. Every single night I came out of her place at 10, I started my car and then the lights would come on behind me because the police were outside her house waiting for me to come out. And they drove behind me to the county line and peeled off of the county line every single night. I felt so safe. And that's his way of talking about someone who survived racially biased policing well into the 80s. Again, police officers were required to do this. And this is part of how we still see echoes of racism here. Remember, this is the CJ system is not unique. We see racial bias in a variety of places. So I'll come to the CJ system in a moment. So I'd want to take just a quick aside here. As a scholar who teaches in classrooms, including university, senior level university classes called the psychology of prejudice, sometimes people ask me strange questions. They say, do you feel like systematic racism is real? Or do you believe in systematic racism? And I said, well, that's a strange way to say that. Nobody asks us a uh, I know a virologist, nobody asks him if he feels like viruses cause influenza or if he, if he believes, if he has a feeling that viruses are involved in um, various different illnesses, they ask him about the data. When people ask me about systematic biases, it's not something I feel or something I believe or it's not a political position, it's about the data. So I assume you all have seen the study. It came out in Nature Human Behavior. It was Pearson et al. They analyzed almost 100 million traffic stops. And black and brown people are more likely than white people to be stopped by police. And if you want to use present the same data a different way, you can say that white people are less likely than their neighbors who are not white to be stopped by police. It's in the data. You know when the, the biases shrink? They shrink under a series of conditions. They shrink at dusk, at dawn, and at night, and in heavy weather. And you see what those things have in common. Yes, as soon as officers can't see the race of the driver, policing looks more equitable instead of more racially biased. But this is not unique to policing, remember. These are the data that we see where, again, black women are four times more likely than white women to die in childbirth when they have the same insurance that if you send black and white men and women who are actors into clinics around the country who are trained to portray a certain set of cardiac symptoms, white men get better care recommendations than black men or white women who will all get better care recommendations than women who are not white. Again, in experimental studies, it's everywhere. It's K through 12, it's university education. I'm involved in these issues at my own university and a variety of other places. So it's not unique to the CJ system. We should be aware racial biases exist at every level of the CJ system. 
from who is stopped, from if people are stopped, who is charged. Pearson and all noted that it's a higher bar to search white people than to search other people for police officers. It's if charged, how are people charged? If people get plea deals, how do they get plea deals? It's if they go to trial, what are the charges? It's how juries see people, it's how judges sentence people. It's all the way through the death penalty where white people, pardon me, black people who murder white people are more likely to get the death penalty than anybody else in the US. And white people who murder black people are less likely to get the death penalty than anyone else in the United States. So we see these consistently. And it's not surprising we see this in our history. Don't worry, we're coming back to the interrogation here in a moment. There was one quick note here to come right back to Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. Darren Wilson is the white police officer who shot Michael Brown, who was black. The easiest explanation for that is Darren Wilson's a bad guy. But remember, he was trained by people who had competitions for which officer can write the most citations to a black motorist or a pedestrian in a single traffic stop. So who can get the most citations stacked up on one arrest if the person who's being stopped is black? The, his, his teachers, his mentors were competing with each other on that. How do you be a good officer in that environment? And who trained his mentors? The people who trained his mentors were the people responsible for making Ferguson a sundown town as required by law and running a chain across the entrance to Ferguson every night at sunset to ensure that Ferguson was white people only after dark. And if you're having that moment of, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've read the Supreme Court cases. This, I've, read my, I've read my American history book. I know this is un-American and we shouldn't do this. Do we hire police officers who refuse to support local law? Of course we don't. We have to see the history of this. We need to understand this. Remember, we have to, if we can't see it, we can't study it. If we can't study it, we can't understand it. If we can't understand it, we can't address it. We're now going to take that perspective back into interrogation. Again, we see the, the biases are very clear. Remember, Philando Castile is a black man living in predominantly white areas of Minneapolis. He was stopped at least, I'm looking at my notes here, at least 46 times between July of 02 and July of 2016 when he died in a traffic stop. It's not surprising we see you're going to see these biases in an interrogation. So we have informing U.S. policing, which is going to take us into interrogation, a European track and an explicitly racially biased slave patrol track that combine to give us civilian policing in the United States. That's going to shape the structure of civilian policing, which is in turn going to shape the structure of police interrogation then and now. So that's where we're going. And just as a quick note, I saw in the chat, the mistakes were made by not by me. We're going to talk about, that's a book about cognitive dissonance. We're going to talk about those cognitive biases and how they interfere with people's ability to evaluate confession evidence. So we'll go right there if we have time. We'll have a great time. I got to watch uh, Carol Tavros speak about this at RMPA the other year at a group on a research convention I'm involved in through psychology. So we're going to come back to that. Right here, though, in the U.S., we started civilian policing in a series of cities and Historians call the political era from its inception to about 1930. The political era of policing would look very, very different than policing looks today. How did you get a police job in the early 1900s in the US? The mayor picked you. How did you get it? It was political patronage. You were hired by the mayor and you served only at the discretion of the mayor and you had no other requirements. There's no police academies, no educational requirements, no job security. Are you loyal to the political, to the mayor's goals? And if we elect a new mayor, my goodness, that seems like we're going to fire the whole police, whole police force and rehire it. Darn straight. Can you see this is not a career? You have no job security. You have no confidence about this. And corruption was widespread. Mayors used police forces to fulfill their own goals. So remember, mayors were elected. Who could vote? Who couldn't vote in the early 20th century? Can you see who has a voice in this? Can you see the mayor's biases about immigration and race and religion might affect how policing happens in their jurisdictions? So corruption was widespread. Uh, Otto Bettelheim quoted a slang phrase in U.S. cities, quote, our last prop is the cop, unquote, at this time. Now that I'm out of control, if you've noticed in Bugs Bunny, the police officer is always Irish from mid-20th century Bugs Bunny cartoons. Do you ever wonder about that? 
Remember, Irish people were not viewed as white then. Remember, race in the US is not about, it's not about skin color, it's about other things. Irish people were not viewed as white and policing was a very low paying, very low status, not a career, not exploited by a home, a very devalued occupation. That was done by people often who were systematically devalued in culture and this was reflected in Bugs Bunny. I know y'all totally expected Bugs Bunny today. So what does that mean for interrogation right here in the middle of the US and all of this? It means that there was only, you had to fulfill the mayor's goals. That's your job as a police officer. Did you not notice what you didn't hear me say? You didn't hear me say court oversight. You didn't hear me say journalists watching you. You didn't hear me say public outcry. You didn't hear any of these things. So police interrogation prior to the 1930s was almost unimaginable for us. Physical coercion was routine. Torture was routine. Um, they would deprive people of food, water, and sleep. Beatings that left marks and didn't leave marks. They'd put people in super hot sweat boxes, and they used what they called the water cure. The water cure, doesn't that sound like warm and tingly inside? And we can guess what that is. Yes, we are talking about waterboarding. That was common in US police departments. As well as legal abuses, holding people indefinitely without charge, holding people isolated from families and lawyers and so on. How common were legal abuses? So common they showed up in the Hardy Boys. I know we were ready to go from Bugs Bunny to the Hardy Boys. Frank and Joe catch somebody who's running around. They drop him off the local police station. The police officer says, don't worry, we'll put him in the cell and hold him until he's willing to talk. And I thought, wow, gross, egregious constitutional violations of a suspect's rights right here in the Hardy Boys. How widespread and accepted are these if Frank and Joe Hardy can do it? Very widely. Uh, physical beatings were common, including beatings of children, as hard as that is for us to imagine. So I'm going to use two examples to illustrate this. One is about how common, how powerful was this? There was a 1906 case in Chicago that a psychologist believed was a false confession. It's a young man who is described, you might see him today, someone with an intellectual disability, and he's being interrogated for a really serious crime. The psychologist in 1908 said, I think he had a moment of what the psychologists called auto hypnotization or self hypnotization. There was a flash, and then he remembered things that were false and he believed them for a while, and then he tried to take his confession back later. But that flash, we should deeply study the flash. What could cause the flash? How could the flash affect his brain? And there was a lot of debate about this. Nobody, not a single legal observer that I could find at that time, raised questions about the source of the flash. There was a detective pointing a loaded revolver in the face of the 19-year-old, and the detective was telling the 19-year-old that the detective would kill him right now if the 19-year-old did not confess. Can you think of any reason for a false confession that doesn't rely on a flash and self-hypnosis? Are there some other possible causes there? Nobody brought those up. This was so typical at this time that that was not viewed as out of hand. Could you imagine a defense attorney or a judge or a court or a prosecutor today watching a police detective threaten to kill a suspect on video with a drawn weapon and not raising issues? And today police would face charges for that. But when I train officers, I don't have to tell them not to do that. Not in 2021. The interrogation manuals in the 60s had to tell officers not to do some, not, not that, but some similar egregious thing. It's really hard for us to imagine. I'll admit, we have a, a paper right now that's coming up for an international convention that's about to be virtually presented next week. We're looking at a 1928 case. They interrogated young adults and children. They took a 19-year-old into the morgue with his, his girlfriend had been murdered, and he, they, he had to put his hands on her body four hours while they interrogated him. And then they interrogated the same group of people, interrogated a 15-year-old who confessed not only in detail, but to lots of different things, depending on what the police thought they knew. And his confession changed a lot. So we've even, we've even done some unusual steps with this. He, we know he confessed. He, so very briefly, if we're going to go fishing in mid-December in 1928 in Michigan, build a gear list in your head. We're going fishing in rural Michigan. It's 1928. We better bring the ice auger, the ice hut, and the fishing resort ice fishing poles, right? He threw the weapon into the lake. Nobody thought about that. He also said he pushed a car a long way down a dirt road. 
We acted like Mythbusters, recruited a pair of teenagers, found a Model T from 1928, and demonstrated that no one teenager could not have pushed this car. You'd think they would have known it at that time, but nobody tested them. This is what typical interrogations were like. And then I'm going to add, I'm, so I'm going to step out from behind the curtain. I'm going to talk about reforms because these will give us guides for reforms today. So what happened to stop torture, including torture of children in police interrogation rooms in the U.S.? A couple of things. There were some journalists who launched public outcries. So Levine, Hopkins, and some others launched national books. There were national magazines and national newspapers that were more common than the investigations. There was a legal investigation from the Department of Justice. Uh, Judge Wickersham launched the Lawlessness and Law Enforcement called the Wickersham Report in 1931. And there was this, and again, we noted that just talking again, torture and police interrogation, these allegations continue about dark sites in Chicago and elsewhere. So we'll keep coming back to these things. Again, these are being fiercely contested in court and elsewhere right now. There were a number of other things. So again, federal investigations, journalism, public responses, and then the court stepped in. Now, the courts finally said confessions generated by torture cannot be admitted at trial. And that seems like it ought to be foundational in our legal system, but that's Brown versus Mississippi in 1936. It is a terrible case involving heinous abuses that I won't describe here. Uh, it's simply terrible. And the, the confessions that were generated by torture were not challenged systematically at trial and elsewhere, it went all the way to the US Supreme Court. There were a number of other cases that limited police interrogation steps. And then the biggest piece was that police facing, again, public outcry, limits by courts, journalists, Department of Justice investigations, and other factors, police reformed themselves. They separated police jobs from mayor's patronage. So if a new mayor gets elected, you still have a job. It became a career. They established educational requirements. They launched police academies. By 1970, every major city in the U.S. had and required police academy training for officers. They launched in scientific investigation tools. They sought to do better interrogations. We're going to talk about how that transition happened in a minute. And this is what Richard Leo called the triumph of professionalism. For just a moment here, Richard Leo is a pretty fearless critic of police. He's willing to be quite critical in a whole bunch of ways. And in his paper about this, he calls these changes the triumph of professionalism. I concur with that language. I want us to hear that getting it being called a triumph came not just from someone who would be strongly supportive of police, but somebody who would be a fierce critic of police would still call it a triumph. So what happened? What did they use to replace physical coercion? Physical coercion in the 30s, 40s, and 50s was then replaced with deception, which has opened the door to where we are now. So Deception came in with the new manuals, manuals by W.R. Kidd, manuals by Fred Inbaugh. Some of you are familiar with the Inbaugh and Reed manual, John E. Reed. Uh, the John E. Reed and Associates is a corporation that still claims to train more police officers than anyone else in the United States. These are people who were involved in writing manuals and launching, replacing coercion, physical coercion with deception. And this has created the landscape where we are now. We're in a world where police deception is absolutely routine, uh, not just for deception in a number of ways. So we'll talk about these as we go here in a moment. But the assumption was that taking physical coercion out would eliminate false confessions. Of course, we know that it does not. So we're going to shift gears and talk about the present. We're going to talk about false confessions and causes. We'll do briefly, we'll do a little bit of typology and then we'll do causes. And this will help us open the door to reforms. We can talk about these issues. And again, I'm, I'm all fired up for good questions here at the end. So we're going to keep, we're going to plan to keep having a good time. So the big, the first foundation that was disputed well into the 90s, and some people continued to dispute it well after that, but today it is disputed by either no one or almost no one, which is that false confessions exist. People have confessed falsely, not just, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, but confessed falsely in great detail to very serious crimes with very serious consequences. Again, people to push this and push back and said, no, this, these cases are errors. There's something else going on. There's a technicality today. We do not see people reject this claim. False confessions exist. People confess falsely in great detail the things that they did not do. 
And to answer your next question, how common are these? Nobody knows. There are some scholars who have made some attempts to do this. I joined with scholars, Professor Forrest and I joined with scholars who argue that we cannot estimate. We simply can't know. The evidence is not available to us. And one of the ways that we, the reason I believe we can't know has to do with the limits of the evidence about the cases we can see. Where do we see documented false confessions? They show up in very serious crimes, almost always homicide, sexual assault, and they show up in those crimes for two different reasons. One is these are the crimes that police may really want to solve and may interrogate people for a little bit longer, use a little bit more deception, use a little bit more intense tactics. And there are, of course, challenges that come with those decisions, but this is not foundationally a critique. I really want police officers to be really motivated to solve serious crimes in my jurisdiction. But these are the risks that come with that. The second issue, again, why is it, why is it about homicide and sexual assault? It takes really strong evidence to disrupt a confession. Confessions are so powerful, they interfere with every other piece of evidence. And confessions can overwhelm anything. Steve Dreisen is a professor at North University of Northwestern or Northwestern University Law School. He's been in this field for a long time. He's taken this blog down now, but for years his blog was up and it said, if you're a defense attorney with a DNA exoneration and I'm a prosecutor and I've got your client's confession, I will see you at trial every time. There are many cases, how powerful are confessions? There are many cases where people have been DNA exonerated before trial. The DNA evidence demonstrates they did not commit the crime, and then they go to trial holding their DNA, DNA exoneration to take on their confession and lose. We're going to add more to that. One of the ways to unpack these can be done with DNA, but often that's not enough. But it's going to be a powerful start. What do homicide and sexual assault cases have in common? It's about the DNA evidence. First of all, there is DNA evidence that's likely to exist in the first place. Unlike an armed robbery where somebody walks in, especially somebody who's clothed and wearing gloves, runs in and runs out. There's no evidence to show who that was or who it's not in the case of a false confession. But in a homicide or a sexual assault, there really might be. The evidence is likely to exist, to be collected, to be stored. And be aware, we have time limits, so we're not going to go down the long road about the, the, the difficult and egregious rates, egregiously slow rates at which rape kits are examined and the number of jurisdictions that have backlogs of hundreds or thousands of these. So there's a number of challenges. But in these places, these are evidence that's likely to exist, be collected, be stored, and more importantly, be stored in a way that could be used at trial years later. That's the other reason that we see DNA exonerations in these cases. So we know that there are other false confessions and other false confessors who are currently incarcerated, but we don't know how many, and they're very hard to identify. We're gonna come back to the power here in a moment. And let's do a little bit of topology, and then let's talk about the causes. Now, why would somebody falsely confess? Because that's a, that's a tough one. So let's talk about, just for a brief moment, the topology. So here I'm looking to Kassin and Reitzman, who are both scholars in psychology and the law and in police interrogation in particular. And they've given us three general categories, so we'll be very brief here. One set of false confessions are voluntary false confessions. People know they didn't do it and walk on out there and say that they did. Why would somebody do that? There's lots of different reasons that somebody might do that. They may be struggling with a mental illness. They may they may be looking for notoriety and fame. They may have other legal issues. I remember I live in Colorado. So when John Mark Carr confessed to the murder of John Benet Ramsey, I was part of this group of taxpayers, like every other taxpayer in Colorado, who paid for his first class trip back from Thailand to the United States and crab legs he had on the flight to find out that his confession didn't match the evidence and he was not indicated by DNA evidence. Nobody knows why he did that. And this, this voluntary false confessions, especially in high profile cases, can cause all sorts of challenges. Some of you know that in the early 20th century, it was the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's baby that was the crime of the century. Over 200 people confessed to that. Over 200 confessions. The person who was executed for the crime did not confess, and many people believe that he was mistakenly executed. I can't adjudicate that, but 
apparently none of the more than 200 people who confessed to the crime did the crime. And he just I've tried to imagine the police station that day. Oh, we've got it resolved. We've got a confession. You've got a confession. I've got a confession. Oh my gosh, how are we going to unpack these two? Wait, wait, now you've got, and an hour later, you can just see it, right? Okay, ready, kidnapping Lindbergh, baby, over here, please. Line out the door down the street to the left. I mean, please don't jostle. We'll get everybody's name as quickly as we can. Over 200 people. Second category is what scholars call coerced compliant. Somebody knows they are not guilty, but confesses to escape the interrogation. Now, this is easiest to see in cases of physical coercion or torture. It's also easiest to see in cases of legal abuses. So there are four sailors who confess to a terrible crime in Norfolk, Virginia. They are called the Norfolk Four. They have now been released. They served about a decade in prison, each of them. One of those four reports. This interrogation was not recorded, so we don't know if this is true or not. He says that after almost 10 hours, he asked for an attorney. The detective got up, left, came back in, and kept going. And the sailor said, once I asked for an attorney and didn't get one, I knew I was not in the United States anymore. And the only way out of this room is to confess, so I did. Those are easiest to see. There are other coerced compliant confessions out there as well. These are somewhat easier to see than the third group. The third group is the most is the most rare and the most difficult to recognize. These are called people who are called coerced internalized false confessors. A coerced internalized false confession is where someone has confessed to a crime they did not commit and believes they committed this crime. These are very rare. They are very hard to identify. It takes really strong evidence to do this. One of the sailors who's part of the Norfolk Four is one of these people. Joseph Dick confessed in great detail on a series of occasions that Seven, to seven made seven different statements. They took the one that was eventually the most like the evidence and they went to trial with it. Um, he, he took a guilty plea. We're going to talk about that here in a moment as well. He took a guilty plea even though he was innocent. Joseph Dick really believes or really believed that he committed this crime. He wakes up in the middle of the night haunted by nightmares of perpetrating this terrible crime he did not commit. Again, very hard to understand and very hard to find. Remember how do you how are people who are potential false confessors identified? Often they are people who are maintaining their innocence even while incarcerated, when that is not adaptive for people who are incarcerated. Remember, I don't take responsibility for my crime. I didn't do it. How does that impress your parole board? Are you getting out at your first chance for a parole if you make it clear you didn't do this thing you were convicted for? A common misconception is that in prison, everybody says they're innocent. Overwhelmingly, if you're actually in the system, everybody talks about what their crime is. They may not be honest about what their crime is, but overwhelmingly, they're right up front about it. Is accepting responsibility and working on changing yourself is required to get out. Uh, Tim Masters was someone who was mistakenly convicted in Colorado. He was DNA exonerated a little over a decade ago. He said every time people were sitting around talking about who did what, he said he was innocent. Everybody gave him the eye, moved away like, like he was the odd one out. And hey, man, don't you know, you're never going to get out of here if you don't own up to this. People who are coerced internalized false confessors are owning up to it. They're going to the classes. They are working on their own rehab. They're really hard to find. And they're not seeking exoneration, many of them, because they know that they did this. Very difficult. So for us to get to the heart of reform, we should talk about the causes of false confession, because these are some things we can address. So this is a complex legal landscape. We're going to talk about three different categories that are general causes of false confession. And then we're going to talk about how those categories interact. But of course, what judges use, though I'll defer to the judge we have in the, the room with us today, of course. What judges use, of course, is the totality of the circumstances. Um, I'm looking over here at the, in the chat for a moment. Uh, yes, we're going to come back to making errors about confession. Again, the very powerful forces that police face and district attorneys face to solve crimes, especially high profile crimes in communities. This is tough stuff. We're going to come back to that here in a little bit. But judges use the totality of the circumstances. So not just what's one, what's one factor or how do two factors interact, but the whole picture. So we have three general categories about causes of false confession. And the first one of these is about vulnerable suspects. So this is the one that is most intuitive for folks who are watching. Why would somebody confess? And in fact, this is intuitive even for people in the system. There was a district attorney in Colorado who considered false confession, wrote a long list of 
reasons people might falsely confess, including someone may have a severe mental illness. That was the only one he could think of. We break suspect vulnerability into trait and state. So trait is not necessarily a personality trait, it's something long-term about you that makes you more vulnerable. So trait vulnerability, long-term characteristics, being a child, children are dramatically overrepresented among false confessors. We also have being someone with an intellectual disability, because people are often very suggestible, and who has an intellectual disability is really hard to determine. Remember, police officers are experts at a lot of things, probably not intellectual assessment. Not many police officers I know pick up a PhD in clinical psychology in their spare time. It can also be, again, juvenile, mental illness, low IQ, it can also be being someone who's suggestible. Uh, Joseph Dick is someone who's suggestible not only on evaluations, but in interactions. He, right there on camera with a filmmaker in a documentary, he said, how many statements did you give? Joe, and he said, I gave four. And then she said, wasn't it seven? He said, yeah, I gave seven. Uh, Johnson puts it in the GSS one and two are good Johnson's suggestibility scales. He talks about shift and yield in response to external pressure. Joseph Dick is someone with strong trait vulnerability. As a quick note, sometimes people make mistakes. They think, oh, well, some people are vulnerable and the rest of us aren't. That is a flat out dangerous belief. We are all vulnerable. Some of us are more so than others. We have to be very aware. So there's trait vulnerability. There's also state vulnerability. So someone who is intoxicated, someone who's in state is a temporary factor, intoxicated and withdrawal, very tired, very stressed. Remember, stress and fatigue are almost ubiquitous in police interrogation. So stress and fatigue. You can't really do an experimental study of fatigue and false confession. Oh, yes, you can. Some people, including Elizabeth Loftus, a, a very prominent psychology and law scholar, ask people to do a simulated interrogation experimental study when they arrived in the lab or after they stayed up for 24 hours. The people in the awake for 24 hours group were much more likely to falsely confess. We see these factors not only in the archival work in the archival findings from actual cases, but in the experimental literature. So some suspects are more vulnerable. A second category is about police biases. Police are human, social, and cognitive decision makers. And occasionally people misinterpret this. They say, oh, you're saying some people, the problem is that some people think like police. The problem is that it's not that some people think like police. The problem is that police think like people. They are social, they are human, social, and cognitive decision makers, and they are prone to the same errors that the rest of us are. They are prone to seek confirmation of what they believe instead of disconfirmation. And so when they have a theory of the crime, they are prone to support that. It's a, great, it's a fiction book where the detective looks at the other atypical detective. This is fiction and say, but what's your theory of the crime? And the special agent from the FBI says, I don't have a theory of the crime. And I strongly recommend that you don't have a theory of the crime either. In an experimental study, some scholars gave actual police officers a theory of the crime and then two witnesses. One witness supported that theory. The other witness didn't. Both witnesses made their identifications under almost identical situations, identical contexts. Police officers, given those two eyewitnesses and a chance to change their theory, or pardon, given one of those two eyewitnesses, when police officers got the contradictory eyewitness, they devalued the eyewitness rather than change their theory. This is being human. And I've had officers say, yeah, 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 but you, you and the ac you academics, you don't know what it's like to gather evidence over the theory of a crime. There's legwork, there's teams of people, there's lots of techs involved. There are hundreds of human hours involved in this. We're deeply invested, we're working with judges. All of that stuff is really hard to challenge. I said, yes, it is. Except in the study, you know where they got the theory of the crime? Not for any of that, it was given to them by psychologists. They read it on a sheet of paper once. That's what it did. Again, this is not because some people think like police, this is because police think like people. And when people are very convinced of the, someone's guilt, it is people see ambiguous evidence in complex ways. So I'll, I'll note that there are a, there's a number of different challenges to this. Again, how powerful is it? So I'll, I'll go ahead and lob this one out. There's a 16 year old in Oakland who was arrested for homicide. 
how powerful are confessions and bias? During his interrogation, he was surrounded by several officers. It was really intimidating. It went on for a long time. They used a number of different concerning tactics with him. And then they asked him to draw the crime scene and he didn't draw it correctly. He left out an alley and they had the opportunity and say, wait a minute, he's not drawing this as though he were there. Maybe he wasn't there. Instead, they said, why are you lying to us? You know where that alley goes. And he put the alley in where they told him to. Now they've contaminated the confession. So later, when defense attorneys wanted to see, did his drawing match the crime scene? Now it does, even though he wasn't there. You just saw this get more hard, to, far more difficult to detect. That juvenile also decided he knew he was innocent. He gave a coerced, compliant, false confession. He gave the police another false detail, hoping they would go look for it. He said, I gave the murder weapon to my grandfather. Both of his grandfathers were deceased. He thought the police would go check that. They did not. How powerful are confessions and bias? That juvenile was at trial, was in juvenile court, sitting there, looking at the paperwork, and it was him. He's the one who raised his hand and said, we have a problem. And it wasn't, I want to be really clear, it wasn't prosecutors, the police, the courts, or his own defense attorneys who caught it. That juvenile had been incarcerated in juvenile detention for a separate crime at the time of the homicide. I asked a police officer recently, so another one who's a trainer with me, training police. I said, imagine we hired you to be a, a, an investigator for a defense attorney. What's your very first question for our suspect? He said, well, where were you at the time of the crime? Nobody asked. How powerful are confessions? After he confessed, nobody asked that question. He was in a box on camera. We know he didn't do it, and his defense attorneys didn't get it. This is how powerful the bias is. So vulnerable suspects, investigatory biases, and then some interrogation tactics are particularly dangerous. Uh, minimization. You know, it's no big deal. This happens all the time. It's just, it's, it's, I deal with this every day. It's no big deal. If I minimize the legal and moral severity of the crime, we see this in experimental studies and it shows up in a number of cases. This increases false confession rates. Uh, occasionally, people engage in maximization where they exaggerate the legal and moral severity of the crime. Now, sometimes that these are when people talk about a phrase that's often called good cop, bad cop, where one officer maximizes and one officer minimizes. Remember, in real life, that's really hard to coordinate because two officers in the same room at the same time are pretty expensive and it's hard to operate. One officer suggested to me that if there's a good officer, bad officer play, it's like car sales. If I'm the salesperson, I say, no, no, I agree with your deal. I'm so ready. That's a great deal. And I'm going to give it to you. Then I go to the bathroom. And I come back and say, you know, my boss just won't take it. I, I, I believe in you, but my boss won't take it. I, I just need a little more. And except in here, instead of my boss saying, I won't take your sales deal, it's my supervisor who says, no, I need more information. I can't believe you didn't do it. I got to you got to answer some more questions. for me. What it may be the most controversial form of deception is one that is very common in a 2007 survey, 92% of detectives reported using it at least some of the time, and this is deception about evidence. This is a false evidence boy. This is a claim to have evidence that suggests somebody's guilty even though such evidence exists. Well, there are false evidence ploys in almost every single documented false confession. And in the experimental studies, False evidence boys raise false confession rates. But wait a minute, aren't there lots of different forms of experimental studies with a wide range of outcomes? Remember, there are some outcomes, some studies where 0% of people confessed. And just to answer your next question, there are some studies where 100% of their innocent suspects confessed falsely. How do you do that? You do it with fabricated evidence. Wow, so some are zero, some are 100, a lot of them are between. How do you do that? You do that with meta-analysis. So in a study, each person, each participant provides data and we analyze that data. And a meta-analysis, our unit of analysis is the outcome of a study itself. So we look back across a series of studies and use their outcomes as data points and then analyze their outcomes. I was part, I was a co-author on the meta-analysis of confession studies that demonstrated that false evidence boys increase false confession rates by 20% or more, depending on the methods used. These are particularly contentious issues and particularly contentious fights.
that's a particular one. Then we look at the ways these things interact, especially if they interact in the form of errors. So before I go to a vulnerable suspects, what about biases and interrogation tactics? Some of you are familiar with the case of Kirk Budsworth. Uh, Kirk Budsworth was accused of an absolutely terrible crime. It involved a child and a rock, and that's all I'm going to say about it. He was identified by five, count them five, highly confident eyewitnesses. Imagine you're a police detective. Are you not confident of this person's guilt? Five people in a simultaneous lineup. So they looked at a bunch of different people and five witnesses in a row picked him. They didn't have the actual perpetrator. Apparently, Budsworth really did look like the person who was last seen with the victim. They were really sure it was him. So they used a form of deception about evidence that was controversial. They used what they used something that had been pioneered by a particular FBI agent it's called the evidence room. He said you put people in a room full of evidence about them, and they can stand there and look at all the evidence and go into the interrogation room. He even recommended that you make it look like a crime drama. So you've got a dry erase board with strings and lines and pictures and arrows everywhere. And you put a label with their name on it on every box on the shelves and all the binders, even if the boxes and binders are empty. They all have the suspect's name on it. You let somebody stand there for a while and then walk them in. Or you give them an, an evidence inside the room and have them interact with fabricated evidence. The first team of interrogators followed this method. Budsworth sat down in the room and they had a rock on the table and the rock was covered in stage blood. And Budsworth said, so what do I do? Most people don't keep rocks inside, especially rocks that look like this. What do you do if you're innocent? Do I say, all right, let's talk about the rock? Did I just convince him of my guilt by saying that? Do I sit here with a rock on the table between us and say, how about them Broncos? Does that just convince them that I'm guilty? What do you do? So the first group of officers watched Bodesworth interact with the rock and decided based on his behavior, he was guilty. They were wrong. But then they made another error. They didn't tell the second team that they had done this. And the second team thought the rock had been kept out of the media and nobody knew about that except the police and the perpetrator. And they sat down with Bodesworth who said, what, we're not going to talk about the rock? I thought we were going to talk about the rock. Nine years almost nine years on death row. My colleague, Professor Krista Forrest, was part of the scholars who organized a criminal justice psychology day at the University of Nebraska Kearney, where she works. So the CJ people and the psychology people both invited prominent speakers. The CJ folks invited the FBI person who developed that technique. My colleague invited Bloodsworth. Those few people ended up in the same place at the same time. And everybody at the end of the day was about to go out for dinner together. And my colleague stopped and looked at Budsworth and said, you know, I, I bet, you know, that guy's right over there. He's involved in the set of techniques that led to the errors that, <clears throat> that prompted much of your outcomes. I bet you don't want to go have dinner with, I bet you don't want to be in the same room with him. And Budsworth said, no, no, you, you're right. I, I really don't want to be in the same room with and he doesn't want to be in the same room with me either. And at which point my colleague said, well, let's go down here and have a beer. So, well, and we'll come back. I'm just watching the chat. We'll come back to some of these here in a little bit. So often these interact in complex ways. So a case, <clears throat> a case that's important, that's the topic of my 19, uh, 2017 Wyoming Law Review, was Tyler Sanchez. Again, how powerful are confessions? Police were looking for a man, a 190 pound man in his mid forties with medium length brown hair and no visible tattoos. They took the confession of a 130 pound 18 year old with a red buzz cut and sleeves inked up both arms. People start my class with, okay, I get it. I get, I, I get it. Confessions are really powerful. That's fine. They end my seminar in the psychology of interrogation confession with, you know, I think after 16 weeks, I don't have any idea how powerful confessions are. Professor Forrest and I don't think we know how powerful confessions are. So what do we do? What do we do? Especially given what people call, what Richard Leo calls the myth of false confession, which is nobody confesses unless there is a, a person has a severe mental illness or there's torture. And of course that's false, but it's a very common belief. These are, so I want to talk just for a moment about the power of confessions, then I'll be aware of time will come right here. Again, as we know, as soon as police really think they've got somebody, and remember, we, police are motivated reasoners because they're people. One more time, it's the problems don't occur because some people think like police. They occur because police and prosecutors think like people. 
And when we really want to be right, we are prone to errors. In every single conversation we've had with officers, officers have said that inducing a false confession and using it to generate a, a mistaken conviction would be one of the worst events of a whole career of law enforcement. No exceptions. And most of these that we're discussing are errors. There, there, be where, there is bad behavior. So I'll note this briefly. Matt Livers, officers induced Matt Livers false confession in Nebraska. They believe the confession so strongly that one officer planted blood evidence to support that false confession. Uh, that officer eventually went to trial and then faced lawsuits. But when a confession happens, it affects everything. Of course, it affects the suspect powerfully. It often stops the investigation. Uh, Jeff Deskovic confessed to a crime. The person who actually committed the homicide for which Deskovic went to prison committed another homicide while Deskovic was in prison. They it, And confessions impact everything. Confessions get eyewitnesses to change their identifications. They ask the people in the study to watch the crime and then come back two days later and pick the perpetrator out of a lineup. The actual perpetrator was not in the lineup. About half the people picked somebody. They were wrong. About the other half the people didn't pick somebody. They were right. And then they brought people one at a time back into the lab two days later and said, oh, we interrogated two people. That one confessed and that person resisted. Did you look at these people again? And about half the people across both groups didn't change their ID. But among the people who did change their ID, they all changed the person they were told confessed, no exception. Confessions affect eyewitnesses. Confessions affect fingerprint experts. ETL Drawer worked with fingerprint experts who had years of experience, the top certification in England, and looked at actual fingerprints people had previously evaluated. When you give people confession information, it changes experts' fingerprint identifications. A drawer, uh, Askin Granhag argue this also happens with DNA analysts, especially with complex DNA evidence involving multiple people and challenging acquisition procedures. What we see, uh, Saul Kasson and his colleagues did a study of forensic errors. If you look at mistaken eyewitness testimony and false convictions as causes of convictions of the innocent, and you look for forensic errors, they're, they're present broadly, but the bad eyewitness and false confessions are not different until the confession and then forensic errors get much more common in confession cases. It's not surprising we see what people call bad lawyering. So to come back to Joseph Dick, who is one of the Norfolk Four, People pushed his attorney. You told you he was innocent. You got him to take a plea deal. I'm paraphrasing for his attorney here. This is in, from the PBS Frontline documentary called The Confessions. So paraphrasing his attorney, his attorney said, I couldn't believe he would confess to that falsely. I thought he was guilty. Everybody else thought he was guilty. I was sure he had done it. And this is Virginia. We execute people here. <clears throat> I thought if we had gone to trial to try to recant his confession, he would be dead by now. He said, my job, he said, I view my job as a defense attorney in a capital trial is to save my client's life, to keep my client alive. And I was very confident that here in Virginia, if we had gone to trial, he would have done it. So yeah, I told him to take a plea deal and I wish I hadn't done that because he's insane. Very hard places to be. So I know we're right here at time. So I want to just have a quick note here. So I'll be brief about, talked about jurors and judges earlier. Jurors and judges recognize coercion just fine. This is about what, part of what we found. They, we ask people, give people different techniques. Jurors, like judges, recognize coercion readily. And then they, in some cases, they tell you they ignored the confession because it was coerced. But then they coerce, they, pardon me, they convict like they've seen confessions. So very briefly, if we give three groups of mock jurors, confession, if one group has no confession, the other group has a confession that's not coerced. So in the no confession condition, we have few convictions. If we have very little other evidence. The uncoerced confession, we get high conviction rates. Then we give people in the middle group a confession, but it's clearly coerced. They say, oh, that's coerced. They can identify it. They say, I ignored it. If they really ignored it, they'll perform like this group, right? Like there's no confession there. They don't perform exactly like the group that has the non-coerced confession, but they're close. They tell you they ignore it. But they don't. And then Wallace and Kasson took that to a group of judges, and judges, also being human decision makers, tell you the confession is coerced in, this, in that middle category. They tell you it's coerced. They tell you they ignored it. They still convict much more like they've seen. So what do we do? 
there's a couple of things that are out there. So I encourage you to pay attention. There's some things are happening, like to go back to 1930s. We have legal cases that are changing rules about deception. You may be familiar with Adrian Thomas's case. So this is terrible. Uh, the, involved the death of his infant, and police detectives told him that if he, if Thomas didn't confess, they would charge his wife. They and they said, if you don't confess, we will not be able to save the life of your son. Your son's life will only be saved if you confess to us how you killed your son. They didn't tell him his son was already deceased. The court ordered a new trial without the confession in ways that they would not likely have done over a decade. So courts are changing. We also see journalists being involved. We see false confession documentaries about the Central Park Five or now the Exonerated Five. We see work about the West Memphis Three, about uh, maybe making a murderer and other documentaries that are out there. We also see not just documentary makers, but other journalists addressing this. And right now, legislatures are addressing it. There's a bill in New York to end all police deception. The bill has passed in Illinois and all police deception with juveniles. And there's a similar bill in Oregon. But there are some other ways to do this as well. So some things, those are the things that were here from the 30s that we want to grab today. But we have some new things. We have a body of scholars now studying this that we didn't have in the 30s. We have a group of scholars who are willing to engage in expert testimony. I'm one of them. Those are things we didn't have in the 30s. And we also have lots of new methods that don't rest on, on deception. And then we have, I think, the most important tool. Remember what Richard Leo called it, the triumph of professionalism? I'm going to attempt a demonstration involving a picture, then I'll be done here. So, ready? We're going to attempt this. This is something that gives me great hope about the future for transition. One of the scholars, as a scholar in my field, who said, no, US is not going to change. Confrontation and deception are too deeply rooted in the system. I think they really might. So, ready? We're going to do an exercise in stereotypes with me. Ready? Visualize with me tough detectives, tough senior detectives who aren't going to buy this academic stuff about deception, who are not going to walk away from confrontation and deception. Envision tough senior detectives who aren't going to buy this stuff. Can you see them? Okay. How many of you are thinking about these guys? Do these guys look like the tough senior detectives you were thinking about? Let me answer your next question. No, these are not people from Central Casting. These are the guy on the left is Greg Stearns. On the right is Tim Marsha. They're senior detectives in LAPD robbery homicide. And they were the first people in LAPD robbery homicide to get trained by the Human High Value Detainee Interrogation Group, which launches rapport building, non deceptive, non confrontational interrogations. They used it to solve a very high profile case where someone had been interrogated repeatedly and they got the confession. Is that for, if you're into this, it was the case of the Hollywood head, if you're familiar with that. These are the real officers. The guy on the right said, um, I like to work. I don't like to train. I didn't want to do this. I tried. I just tried it. And now they are some of the leading trainers and proponents of this. This is my hope. These are the people. And look, they're in their interrogation room. If this paint chip is somewhere, it's called institutional hopeless gray or something like that. They're in their interrogation room. These are the people who give me optimism for where we're going. So I look forward to your questions here. That was amazing, sir. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. So, so I encourage everyone, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll call on you. I'll go ahead and ask a quick question. So uh, how do we make the change from where we are uh, from that uh, Jim Crow law systemic uh, deception in our environment to a place that is better, right? Excellent. These are some of the challenging things to do. And the very first thing, again, I think that we need to see is to very clearly see it. And it's very challenging in today's environment. Um, I'm aware that our book that we had, thank you for putting the link there in the chat. Um, I'll just go ahead and say it out loud. There's a number of states where you can't bring our book into classrooms. It's illegal because we cite data about systemic racism. And I'm going to make a funny now. I'll, I'm telling you in advance. I'm not good at this. I'm telling you up front so you know it's coming. We quoted people from those liberal, commie, Marxist, out of control, anti-American group, the Department of Justice for systematic racial biases. And of course, the Department of Justice, you can, there's lots of people with lots of things of the Department of Justice. It's not a group of liberals. 
but we cite Department of Justice data that shows very clearly at every level of the system, racial bias is present and publicly available data generated by a variety of different groups. And we cite those data and other data, again, really strong peer review data about biases and traffic stops. And seeing the data, again, this isn't a hope or a feeling or a belief or a political view or being politically correct or feeling warm and fuzzy about myself. This is about the data. And it's starting with the data to see this. So to note a, a couple of, um, so I'll do a couple of things here and then we'll do some questions out in the group. Again, what are some of the challenges, especially if somebody has been previously convicted of a sexual crime or any other crime, these legacies are lifelong. Uh, Tim Masters was DNA exonerated in 2008. He doesn't work right now. He said, a lot of people want jobs. A lot of people are hiring for jobs and you do a background check for him. It says first degree homicide dash cleared. Somebody else wants, somebody else gets that job. These are lifelong consequences. And yeah, I went to jail for 10 years, but I really didn't do it. How does that fly in your employment, in your hometown, in your neighborhood, in non-religious groups or religious groups or other organizations? How does that fly in the places that we go? This is some of the tough stuff. And we had a great comment here that I'll open for questions. What about police lying in multiple places? This is another reason. There's a couple of reasons that we promote, we argue against police deception. One is about false confessions. That's foundational for us. But also a number of scholars have said if police can lie in the interrogation room, are they going to lie on the stand? Are they going to lie in depositions? Will they lie to internal affairs? Will it get easier to lie elsewhere? Not because they're police, but because they're people. That's a concern. And then also their racial biases in mistaken convictions and false confessions is powerful. One is that officers have, remember officers' biases, they know who's guilty by race. But if I'm a black man, do I know the stereotypes about black men in crime? Of course I do. So what do I do when I go into interrogation? I know they think I'm guilty. So I sit more rigidly and I try to control my posture more and I engage in behaviors that are likely to be mistaken for guilt. There's a series of peer-reviewed studies. On this. Hmm. What questions do we have? All right, uh, so first we have Charles, then Chad, then I'm gonna read uh, the one from Philip. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of them in there. So uh, Charles, you're up, sir. Thank you, Dr. Woody. That was very, very interesting. Um, well, we gotta start with the data, as you say, and um, you're obviously aware of the Stepping Up Initiative uh, from the federal government that is about gathering data about incarceration rates, costs, and recidivism. Just a three brief points, but are there pockets of America, do you think, that are open to judicial reform to provide the data from the reforms that you're talking about? Um, I know this is not a simple transformation, but is there a best practices model that could be employed in parts of the country that are ready to have something new and then provide that? Okay, yeah. Great question. Um, there's a number of places, especially in the last 10 years, where prosecutors are running for office on very different platforms than they did even more than just over a decade ago. Traditionally, through much of the 20th century and the early 2000s, prosecutors ran on tough on crime and on tr tough on crime platforms, transferring juveniles to adult court, which every state made easier in the 90s. Transferring juveniles to adult court, seeking more convictions, doing long convictions, but in the last decade, we've seen reformers running for office and pushing for, pushing for alternative sentencing, pushing for alternative drug courts or teen courts, alternative courts for some people in diversionary sentencing. The realization of the vast cost of incarceration and the high rates of recidivism. Now, this is not new information. So to go back to the early 70s, there were many criminologists who did not, who thought the US was done building prisons, certainly children's prisons, because those tactics were so clearly ineffective. And then we made a bunch of really different decisions with mandatory minimums and, and other issues in the 70s. So there's some criminal justice reforms that are available that exist right now in a number of jurisdictions. But also there's a number of reforms we talk about in our book that are very popular broadly. Uh, a very conservative DA in Colorado, who's running for governor, who's ran for governor on a very conservative platform, launched a, a mistaken conviction, a conviction integrity unit in his prosecutor's office. And we support that very broadly. And people from his political affiliation pushed back and said, how dare you do this? And he said, look, he takes a very strong line as being tough on crime. He said, we're not looking for technicality or releasing people who have been convicted and are guilty. We're trying to find errors. Any human system has errors. 
So we're seeing this in some areas, so some reform-minded prosecutors running for office on reform platforms, but we're seeing some of the safeguards like co-responders, mental health responders to interact with people with mental illnesses and conviction and integrity units in a variety of different prosecutors' offices, regardless of political affiliation. Great question, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Chet, you are up next, and then I'm gonna read one from Philip. Go ahead, Chet. Okay, uh, hey, really good talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, one thing that struck me is you talked about how difficult it is to segregate people. And you named a number of legal institutions. All of these were legally based institutions that, mm -hmm. that segregated us. And, uh, you know, we tend to value the law. We value social contracts because we think without them, we can live together. But I think there's many ways that the law segregates us to the point that the loneliness is endemic in most modern cultures. And I, I guess that, that's not your bailiwick, I know, but I guess that's a comment. But one, one other thing is the, the neat thing, one of the neat things you said is that all this isn't happening because of bad actors. There's obviously bad actors, but that's a minor part of it. It's sincere, honest people that if they knew the mistake they were making, they would be horrified. And uh, I think if we're ever going to get to the bottom of this, we need to see, we, we tend to think that uh, our possibilities as human beings are limited only by our imaginations. And I think that you pointed out a lot of ways that our minds fail us in ways that we can't imagine. And uh, I think it's, what we really need to do, instead of get rid of bad actors, we need to understand more about the limitations of the brain. Absolutely. So uh, we have a chapter on safeguards and a separate chapter on recommendations. And of course, these reflect the prior sections of our book. And we talk, we talk what are resources we can provide to police to help them challenge human cognitive biases? Can we, can we recommend systems of policing in which people designate a, a devil's advocate. We recommend it also for those of you with military background. Sometimes if you want to test our attack plan, we designate a B team and our really good people go play the bad guys to see if we're in our, in our simulation to see if, see where the challenges are with our plan. Attorneys do this to prepare for trial. Can we designate a B team in our, or an alternate team you know, an op force team, pardon me, in our interrogation world, have somebody challenge us on maybe this is not the right person. What tools can we provide for this? How can we provide tools to protect children in interrogation rooms? Because to answer your next question, parents might believe the police and parents might even be the crime victims. Are they, do parents uniformly advocate for their kids' rights and protections? Unfortunately, they do not. So what can we do to go beyond that common sense action and get a guardian ad litem or another legal representative in the room for the child. What can we do, again, to support police making these decisions? Because as you said, there are bad actors. So I mentioned the case in Nebraska where somebody planted evidence to support a false confession induced by his team. But the people who induced the original false confession didn't know that they had a suspect with a cognitive disability who was very suggestible. Yeah. If they had support in the room to identify that, they might have stopped. The officers in the Tyler Sanchez case, Tyler Sanchez is an 18 year old with a cognitive disability and a very low IQ. That case went, I'll avoid some of the legal minutia, that went all the way to the 10th circuit. Those officers lost their qualified immunity. They may lose their homes for this. What if they had a co-responder in the room with them who would walk out and say, you know, you think this guy's behavior is a little weird. The officers gave him a urinalysis to see if he was intoxicated. What if they had had a trained professional they could call in as a co-responder to say, I'm very concerned this person may be suggestible. Let's stop and back up and maybe either interrogate him again tomorrow when we have a better grip on what's going on and with additional support or to look for other evidence. Those officers might not be at risk of losing them. Well, thank you. Thank you. So the last question before we wrap uh, from Philip, uh, Phoenix Channel 15 investigation of a group of Black Lives Matters protesters 
revealed that police repeatedly lied and swore testimony on the stand with full knowledge of the county prosecutors. Uh, no one has been charged with per perjury. Uh, stumped trying to figure out why the police seem to be exempt from perjury laws. That, that's one I can't address very clearly. One of the things, again, this is a place if there is evidence of perjury, especially with knowledge of prosecutors, we hope that there are internal investigations or investigations coming out of the judiciary of the prosecutors group who allow people to lie on the stand. There, it is always, anytime we have people testifying, we have tensions about testimony, it gets very challenging. The, again, this is part of how video recording has changed interrogation. It used to be what some scholars call a swearing contest between officers and suspects. So suspects who are already seen as suspects by the jury look at or contrast with an officer in blues and a badge. And sometimes officers may lie and then other times they may simply make errors or they really wanted to give a non-deceptive a non-deceptive interrogation. So as revealed, as demonstrated in the research, their notes devalue deception in their notes and they testify about their notes accurately, but it's not an accurate representation of what goes on. Police have such advantages. That's a place we need to challenge as part of a video recording skill. But the larger issues about perjury in the system are, are very challenging. Um, bad acting shows up in a variety of different mistaken confession cases, and these are some of the challenges. This is a place where sunshine and transparency, one of the many places that sunshine and transparency can help us be more effective. Thank you, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you. Is there anything that you would like to wrap with, sir? I'll just say, I'll encourage you to think broadly about reform. Where can you participate by supporting reform in your community with your votes? with potential prosecutors and our public defenders or others or courts or judges where you live, make people more aware of these issues, and more aware of the ways that we as humans struggle with these issues in particular. So I'll encourage you to, to walk with your public actions and with your votes and with our other tools that we have here, here in this world to affect the CJ system. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And with that, um, I wish to thank everyone for coming and giving this uh, important issue our uh, time and attention. As always, if you enjoyed our content, please hit the subscribe button, contribute to our Patreon, become a member of HSBP, or better yet, volunteer to make the magic happen. With that, be well, stay safe, and take care. Goodbye, HSGP. Thank you very much.